live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hello, welcome back. We're here live in Boston, Massachusetts. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, instruct the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm with Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And our next guest is Ernam Inham, head of marketing and business intelligence at Peak Games. And uh, we're here at the HP Big Data Conference. Um, gaming is the hot market, obviously, uh, for us big gamer fans, we saw Twitch get sold for Google for a billion dollars, which was like a big thing because we know how great that product is, knowing the founders and everything, and just gaming in general uh, is great, and big data is a big part of it. So, Peak, uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Peak Games. So, uh, tell us about what's going on, because we always love to talk about games, because Dave and I, um, you know, Danny Ryan, co-founder of CrowdChat, was at Riot Games back in the early days. And oh built the back end for the Hadoop stuff, and so we know we know the massive amounts of, of opportunity yeah. uh, to do stuff with data, but also the massive data you're getting. True. So talk about Peak Games, the environment, just lay the, lay, lay the land a little bit, what's going on there with the game, the infrastructure, and what you guys are doing. Sure, so um, Peak Games is, is a four-year-old company. Um, we, we're basically building up games. We started as a regional player, uh, in Istanbul, in Turkey, and then quickly expanded into other, other regions. Uh, Middle East first, then, then we decided to go even further to Western countries, to United States, uh, to North America. Um, we now have more than six million daily active users, which is a huge amount of data, uh, as you can imagine. And um, this data is flowing us every day. And um, as you can imagine, the free-to-play business model is usually um, depending on a very small percentage of these daily active users being paid users. So our, our revenues are coming from a very small percentage of these daily active users being engaged players than paying users, you know, becoming paying users. So we, we need this data. Like among millions of apps in the App Store, um, if you want to make a difference, you need to you need to iterate your game so so fast, and so um, in a, in a very dense way, so that people can get exactly what they want from your game, exactly good amount of challenge, good amount of joy, and then they become engaged users, and then they become paid users in the So end. it's a classic freemium model. Yeah, people exactly. Access the game for free, and the people who get hooked want the additional features. They have a community. They want certain things. True. Um, and they and they've already bought in. Yeah, that's kind of your model. Exactly. So knowing when to convert people and offer them, is that an it's, issue? It's usually like if you, if you try hard to convert people to pay, it usually backfires yeah. because <laughs> people people can easily understand <laughs> if you're trying to get yeah. money from them, right? Yeah. So our, our primary aim usually is is to to get them engaged, to make them enough fun and and challenge at the same time, so that they become an addicted player and in the end eventually they might end up paying. You know, we were talking about this earlier with Peter from Yammer, big data science guy, data nerd, growth hacking. Mm -hmm. But you're basically referring to his growth hacks gone bad. Users now are smart, they can smell a growth hack. Yeah. Um, oh, import all your contacts. So the people are now fearful. What is the best way to handle that, in your opinion, based on your experience? Because loyalty is, matters on the web, but also people can get pissed off just as fast as they can get loyal. True. So exactly. what are you, what's your experience in growth hacking and how to do it right? Well, it's, it's getting even harder every day because we're not in the days where you know, everyone posts on their, on their open graph, like on their feeds on Facebook about the farms that they've built on or about little things that they play on in the games. So uh, people are a lot more uh, cautious in what they are posting on Facebook. So what we do usually is try to integrate all the social interactions within the games in a very contextual way so that you know, when people post something, when people invite something, they get a real value out of it. And that's pretty much what other colleagues in our industry are doing as well. So if, if, you, if you want to, to have something from the user, we need to give something to them. Because no one would just invite their friends because they like the game. Because you need to give them something in order to get you know, a value out of them. In terms of their social. What do you think about um, Zynga? Zynga also had a big run when public CEO got ousted, new leadership came in. Um, 
they're free to play games. True. Did they do it right? Did they overplay their hand? No pun intended, given that they had. <laughs> Texas Hold'em was one of their best games. Um, what do you, what's your take on, on Zynga? I mean, still people, still huge numbers, but I mean, what's your take on that? Well, I think Zynga is, is one of the examples how fast our industry is changing. So, um, like, leaders of, of three years ago are still very big players, but it is subject to change. And people get, you know, like in gaming specifically, you need to really iterate, you need to really innovate and evolve your games in the ways people like to see it, you know? And that's, that's how I understand it from Zynga. Like, Texas Hold'em Poker is probably one of the most stable games that people can ever see. Like the, the, you know, the, there's a great amount of people that are still playing it for almost like four or five years now. Um, but you know, the new games, the new um, tries of Zynga, I think you know, uh, it is showing us that there's still a lot of opportunity for new players in the industry, so that you know, everyone can, can, can build up great games and you know, replace all the incumbents in the industry. So you talked about the 80-20 rule, it's probably more like the 99-1 rule in, in your community. Um, and if I understood it correctly, you're using data to try to better understand that small exactly. base that's, that's paying. Um, are, you, are you also trying to understand how to convert maybe some of those other non-paying customers? Or is that just never going to happen? I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, th there's a small group of people who's, who's really willing to pay and who already probably pays when you're looking at them, right? But there's another circle, a secondary circle, who is likely to pay, because they're super engaged, and if you create those moments for them to pay, they, they probably are going to pay. Uh -huh. But there is another outer circle that, that is never going to pay, but you still need to keep them in the game because they trigger the inner circles to pay. So a paying user never pays because he just wants to pay. A paying user pays because he wants to defeat that non-paying user because he has been defeated by him for like a couple of times before. And that's how you trigger the paying user behavior. So the non-paying users are just sort of column fodder for the paying <laughs> users to destroy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are some cases that you really need them to, to you know, trigger in-game behavior. They're pawns. Kind of, yeah. It's a kind of game theory. Um, how have you used data to improve the user experience, or do you use data to improve yeah. the user experience? Um, so for us, um, you know, we need to personalize the user experience inside the game because whenever, like, we have a product, right? The product has three different features. We have a strategy game that you build up your city and attack to your, to your um, you know, other friends in, in the game. So this game has a couple of features. One being a city building game, one be being a battle game, and one being just a, a farm game. So you, we need to understand which user prefers which type of this game and, and you know, alternate the tutorial, the in-game content accordingly. So if a user doesn't want to battle with anyone in our strategy game, we probably won't show our tutorials, you know, battle parts in the game, but just show them a decorative item, uh, the, the, you know, the city building part, so that they can just, you know, go in that way. Same thing for, for, for the, you know, battler type of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much data? What are we talking about here? Well, um, currently we're holding uh, 13 terabytes of data, but it was like nine two months ago. So it's, it's becoming huge, and it's becoming bigger and bigger, and we're probably one of the conservative ones mm -hmm. in, in the industry, so um, you can hear a lot, lot more data. You're in marketing, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, at least part of your job um, and your current role. And there's a big discussion in the industry about how marketing is driving all the spend mm -hmm. in technology. So I wonder if you could talk talk about that within Peak Games. Are you are you the guy with the budget? Yeah. You you know um, how is that shifting? How are you spending that money? That that technology budget? Well, we we had the um, privilege to to have the user acquisition at a very low cost a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So we had the privilege where no one else was, was advertising in our countries as, as gaming you know, clients, but now it, everything got super difficult. So we need to, to look at every little cent that we're spending because you know, the, the prices have increased due to increased competition in, in Facebook, in mobile ad networks, in, in everywhere, simply. Um, so that we need to take care about every penny that we're spending. Uh, and this, you know, you need to you need to be able to understand who's the big player in a particular country, who's 
who we can use alternatively as a B plan, as a C plan, as a D plan, when we're out of the resources in, in Facebook and Google or in any other ad networks. What kind of successes have you had with your analytics projects and, and how do you think they compare to sort of other IT projects? I mean, it used to be the line was that, I don't know, some huge percentage. I think at one point somebody made it up on gut feel, but it was like 40 to 70%, I don't know what the number was, of, of IT projects fail. You don't hear that same type of complaint with analytics projects. And I wonder, is it because the business is more tied into it? But what kind of successes have you had? What kind of success rate do you have with your analytics projects and your big data projects? Well, it differs because um, currently in gaming, most of the analytics projects born out of a need, an actual need, mm -hmm. because the, the game starts to fail at some features. The game needs some, some analytics input of that particular point. So for example, about our, one, one of our latest projects is about matching algorithm of the game. So we needed to um, find a sweet spot in the win rate of the users so that people get enough joy versus enough challenge. So if, you're, if you lose a lot, you churn a lot, right? You, it's you like a slot frustrated. machine. Exactly, <laughs> so if you lose a lot, you, you really get frustrated because you just want to win a bit more yeah. to, keep, to keep playing the game, right? And if you win a lot, you, you get, okay, like, I'm this bored. is boring, yeah. right? I, I want to, to challenge myself. So um, we worked on an algorithm that, that improved um, the, the, the gap, you know, that narrowed down the gap of the win rates among the whole distribution of the users. So it allowed us to, to make everyone pretty much on the same level in terms of the win rates and the lose rates. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, like the next, very next day, the number of games played by each user doubled. And like, it is a good part of gaming, I think. Like, if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of people, every little change you make, every little detail that you're looking into can result in a, I don't know, a doubled revenue, a, 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 like tripled engagement. Huge sample stuff like size. That. Yeah. Huge numbers. Exactly. So that's the question I got to ask relative to the numbers is value to players versus risk of disruptive operations. Because let's just take Hadoop for instance. Say you want to throw a big Hadoop cluster on there. If that's not in your production environment, you at risk of managing the relationship between what you got in production and what's actually good for the big data. So of course you want to store every interaction because you might need that data, a little, you know, certain headshot, and if it's a, if it's a first person shooter game, or if it's a certain move, it's certain, you got to know everything, you got everything. Exactly. So why not store it, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, the need to store to create added value, yeah. either user experience, play experience, or revenue, yeah. or all the above, versus disruptive to the operation, meaning crashing. Yeah. That is true. I think that's one of the most, you know, arguably topics in our industry. So uh, what we usually do is like, the, the, the data that you always need is probably very recent data, versus all the historical logs, you, you probably don't need that much while running the game. So uh, I think, the, the, um, the frequently used data that we keep you know, very tight, that we use to run the game, and at that specific moment, like a matching algorithm, like a, the, the content that the, the, the user is getting, we use it very recent and very tight, mm -hmm. and then you know, storing the rest of the data in, in, in a probably less frequently used uh, you know, places, where we can just ad hoc you know, go in and check in the data. So that's, that's still a problem though, like many, for many gaming companies. So I've got to ask you, the gaming industry in general, um, where do you see it going in terms of the, the you know, free play games, Call of Duties of the world, the consoles, um, obviously mobiles of changing the game for everybody, right? So how is it all going to come together? All integrated in? Do you see the conversion? Do you see some consolidation? What's your yeah. view? I think cross-platform would be probably one of the biggest things that's that's happened. We we already started seeing it, like World of Tanks, like uh, go, goes in mobile uh, without any problems. We'll, we'll see a lot more cross-platform games. We'll see a lot more cross-platform experience. And I believe, like we started learning, quantifying the fun that people are having. So that's that's the good thing for us. We we as gaming people, we, we didn't really look at the, the data before. Like ten years ago, no one was just you know, interested in, in the data that's coming from the players, right? But now we, we, we track almost everything. Uh, it's not working that much at the moment, but it will probably work a lot better yeah. in five years. Yeah, I mean, certainly horsepower for yeah. speed, the Vertica thing will help, but also DevOps, right? Having a cloud, spinning up resources sure. when you need it, versus having to over-provision bare metal. Are you guys all provisioned in-house right now on-prem? Is there cloud? What's the, what's the infrastructure look like? 
Um, we're, we're like uh, most of the, the infrastructure is, is in house because we have to develop it yeah. uh, mm -hmm. ourselves because the, the speed of the data growth is, is super high. Yeah. So that we need to we need to have it in house, and it's it's a critical asset for the company as well. That's why we took it in house. Okay, great stuff. Gaming here on the cube, extracting the value. Directing the signal from the noise, this is the cube. Go to siliconangle.com, go to wikibond.org for free research. Of course, siliconangle.tv was the home of the cube. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Go to crowdchat.net slash HPBigData2014 to follow the conversation. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>